Uh, can you hear me? Yep, good. Okay, yeah, so this is um, work on embedding session types in Haskell. Um, if you saw um, Garrett's talk at ICFP, Talking Bananas, um, here we're, we're looking, in, looking at embedding um, basically the language GV that he talked about, but minus the recursive types, although we could perfectly well extend it to recursive types. Um, and we're building on um, some work that Jeff Polakov presented last year at Haskell on embedding linear lambda calculus in Haskell. He has quite a nice embedding that, that seems a bit cleaner than, than previous ones. So we're, we're very much dependent on that. And this is just kind of an extension of that work. Um, Um, so I'm just going to start off by reminding you of what session types are. So the, the bits in red are talking about normal type systems and session types are in blue. So data, whereas data types describe the structure of data, session types are all about the structure of communication. So roughly we can view a session type as a, a protocol specification that from the perspective of one end of a, a, a communication channel, which we call an endpoint. Um, so whereas a, a, a data type system statically guarantees that, that, that runtime values conform to the structure of their data types, a session type system statically guarantees that the um, communications at runtime conform to their, their protocol specifications. And we call this session fidelity. Um, now I'm going to give you an example, a very simple example. Uh, which is quite similar to the one that, that Garrett showed in his talk. Um, so we just imagine we have a, a simple calculator server. It's going to, unlike his one, it, it doesn't behave exactly like your desk calculator. It just has two operations. It has a binary operation and a unary operation. Um, so yeah, it doesn't remember the previous state. But yes, this is, this is the session type of the calculator. So this thing here says that it, it's going to offer a choice of the binary operation or the unary operation. If we choose the binary operation, then we input two integers, output an integer, and then end. And similarly for the unary operation. And then correspondingly, the, the other end of that channel, a client that needs to talk to it, the client is able to make a choice, and it has to actually send the two integers and then receives one back. Um, yeah, one sort of slightly confusing thing here is that we have these end bang and end query things here. The way to think about this is, is this is kind of where, well, there's two ways of viewing it. This, this says that the server um, just finishes communication on that channel, it closes that channel down. And then this one is, is the client waiting for the server to finish. So we have a kind of synchronization at the end of, of a communication. But it can also be viewed as, as, as the unit of output. This is an empty output and this is an empty input. Anyway, um, as, as Garrett showed in, in his ICFP talk, um, linearity is absolutely crucial here. So that's, that's why we're building on on, on Jeff's work. Um, and roughly the, the, the reason for that is if we want to actually statically track where we are in, in some communication, then it's not going to work if you, if you have two copies of that endpoint, because how will they know how the, how the type has evolved? So now I'm going to just give you an example in our embedding of, of a, I'll start with the client, actually. This type you see here is, is more or less the one I had on the previous slide. The only change is instead of int, I've got b int, which um, is saying that, that we have to actually explicitly um, bang the int in the sense of, of linear lambda calculus. So, so we're being a bit explicit. We have, we have linear values and we have, have values that can be duplicated. So, so that's what 
that type is, but it's, it's otherwise it's the same type. And uh, a GV term is, is the embedded type of, of terms. It's parameterized by our interpretation of channels, because we're going to have multiple different instantiations of this. So my calculation is, is going to take a channel on which to do to communicate with the calculator, and it's going to return an integer. Um, and the, yeah, the embedding is, is a, a sort of HOAS style embedding. So um, this thing is, is a, a linear lambda that takes a channel. Um, I'm going to choose the binary operation in this, this case. This notation is just really sort of syntactic sugar for reverse application. But you can sort of read it a bit like bind. So I first choose to do the binary operation. Then we rebind the channel. But it's evolved now. So now it has, it has the, this type on the left-hand side of the, the um, choice. So it's expecting us to send an integer. So we send an integer. This, again, is, is a bit of noise to say that this is, a, um, this is something that could be duplicated, the bang there. Um, and then we send another integer. We get back a result. This lamb star, the star is, is sort of, uh, that was, this was um, Jeff's naming, I think, but it, it's, it's the thing returned by receive is a pair, a tensor of a channel and a value. So this just deconstructs the tensor into the value in the channel. And then we have to wait to close the channel. Uh, and then this is, this is kind of the unit, the equivalent of this, but for a unit. So it doesn't bind anything. And then finally, we just return the integer we got back. So a nice thing about our embedding is, well, I've, I've, I've slightly cheated here, but this is, if, if we say, if we forget to send one of the integers, so I only sent, sent one, then we get an error message that essentially says this. At the, well, no, it says exactly this at the top of the error message. And then there's loads and loads of rubbish underneath. But you can ignore the rubbish. And, and this, is, this is pretty much exactly what you'd expect. It's, it's saying that the, the type it's, it's found is, was expecting a single integer, but, um, but the specified type said that we needed to supply two. And then, yeah, writing the, the, the server portion of the thing is, is quite similar. Um, so this, this calculator here, the calculator server, is, takes the, the dual type. It's expecting either to pick the, the binary or the unary operation. And then it's going to uh, c entirely follow that protocol and then just return a channel that has, has actually ended. Um, and we're going to instantiate it with the binary operation to be multiply and then unary operation to just be negate. So all it has to do is to offer along that channel a choice between those two things. Um, and then we can implement the multiplier and, and a negator. And this is quite, quite straightforward. Um, I'm assuming I've defined obvious um, implementations of multiply and, and negate just using the, the linear lambda calculus embedding. So this is, this is essentially Jeff's embedding. A another nice thing you see here is that, that the type we've given here, this LLC term, this knows nothing about se session types. So, so our, our extension is, is completely modular. You can define this independently and then define the GV embedding. And then the, the remaining thing you need to plug these things together is, is this fork operator, which um, it takes a computation such as the, 
this calculator one that is, is going to take a, a channel's input and return a, 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 a completely empty channel, the CH of end bank. And then it returns the other end of the channel, which is exactly what the calculation was expecting. So the idea is if we plugged that particular example together, then that would represent computing 42 in the end. Um, OK, so I'll, I'll now go on to describing how, how we actually implement this. So the, 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 the big problem yeah, is linearity <laughs> to start off with. So because Haskell has, has no linear function space built in, it's inevitable that we need to do some kind of, of deep embedding. And many people have done this before, and well, before what Jeff did. And uh, the, typically, you might use, use a, a parameterized monad. So for instance, there's this work, um, pre prior work on embedding session types. It worked that way. Um, the advantages of, of Jeff's approach these. The linear, we, we actually get to treat linear variables as first class things. It's essentially because it's built on a, on a HOAS like embedding. Uh, whereas with the parameterized monad embedding, you have sort of, you have to explicitly project out of the context, and that's, that's a little bit annoying. Uh, the type errors, as I've sort of already said, are, are slightly less bad than, than some of the other embeddings. And we get this nice modularity. So in fact, yeah, this, this slide is, is, is really about the, the steps you have to make to embed linearity at all in any of these languages. Um, there are various different presentations of, of linear logic. Um, we could have a, a single unified environment in which some of the variables are linear and some of them are unrestricted. Um, we can split the environment into linear and unrestricted ones. Um, and then we can go a bit further, and this is the thing you really need to do these embeddings. And this, this is also where the, the parameterized monad embedding arises from, because this is kind of the input parameter and this is the out parameter. So the way to read this is, well, yeah, gamma are just the unrestricted variables, so we don't care about how they get duplicated. But the, um, the delta i is the, the, the variables you have in the, on the, before your, your, your um, judgment, and the, the lambda delta O are the, the variables after you've consumed them. So for the variable rule, um, we, we can actually have a whole load of other variables in the context, as long as they stay the same on the, on the right-hand side. And when we consume a variable, we mark it with a box. So here's, here's how we do conventional higher order abstract syntax in Haskell. Um, so hopefully this should be familiar to most people. Um, so, so I've got a representation that is parameterized by the type. And the key thing is the lambda takes a host level lambda, which means we get to steal the, the binding structure from the host language. Um, so for instance, if I wanted to encode the church encoding of two, I have to write something slightly more verbose, but at least I don't, I don't need to worry about bindings. Um, okay, yeah, so there's papers to refer to here, maybe the, the stuff on finally tagless, and then this is work I was involved in on HOAS specifically. Um, so the, the trick to extending this to support linearity which is, uh, yeah, this is a simplified version of what, what Jeff Polikoff did, um, is we add two extra parameters for representing these, the, the input and output um, environments roughly, except we don't actually need to represent the type of the variables. We only need to represent um, whether they're, they're names and whether or not they've been consumed. Um, and this is actually simplified in two ways from what, what Jeff did. So one is if you have empty types or a top type, 
then you you need to be quite careful because at some point you get to sort of throw away all of the linear types. So we, we just don't, we don't need those for our application, so, so we ignore that. And then the other one, which was a suggestion pointed out by Phil, is that he, he had an additional parameter, which was kind of the next variable name that you needed to generate. But instead of that, we just use the length of the input context and ensure by construction that we're only ever going to build variable names that are smaller than that length. So, um, yeah, the class for this, this linear lambda calculus, it takes, or the way we're representing this, this data from delta i and delta o is as a list of natural numbers. So it's kind of a, a De Bruyne-like representation, and it's a maybe at because the, nothing represents box, something that's been consumed. And now, yeah, this, this, rep, this is the linear lambda um, constructor, and then this is linear application. So this one should hopefully be straightforward. You're just joining together the, the, input con the output context here and the input context there. This one depends on some, some cleverness that I'm not going to talk about, but you can look at Jeff's paper if you want to really understand what's going on there. It's roughly saying that uh, the, the, this, this linear variable here um, is valid in any, any appropriate context of the right type. But here you see that the, the variable that we've bound, it, it's the one at the front of the list, it gets consumed, as you'd expect. And then you can, once you've worked this bit out, um, embedding all the other construct, constructs is, is relatively straightforward. So yeah, um, now I'm finally getting onto this, this language that we're going to embed. So, so this is the language that, that, that uh, Garrett presented the other day, GV. Um, so it's based on this um, functional language with session types that, that um, Simon Gay and Vashko Vashkonselas came up with. And then Phil Wadler um, showed that it corresponded to his logical account of session types. Subsequently, Garrett and I uh, gave a semantics to this language. And it yeah, stands for either good variation or gay in Vasconcelos. So now, finally, to the, 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 the session types in this language that you've already seen them in the examples. It's quite straightforward to represent these in Haskell. We don't need to give any implementation for these data, structure, data, con, data types because we're going to allow different interpretations of them uh, based on this, this sort of finally tagless style. Um, and then there's the notion of duality, which is also, I think, straightforward. Um, it's worth observing the T's here refer to any old type. Because I, I want to be able to send things like integers along a channel. So they don't get dualized when I send or receive. But everything else is just dualized in the obvious way. And we just define that as a, as a type family in Haskell. Um, the constants you saw have these types. I'm not going to go through the details. But it's straightforward to then map them onto a representation which is the same representation you saw for the linear lambda calculus. Um, and these are just renditions of the typing rules, as you would expect. The, the, there are a few subtleties here. So yeah, we're parameterized by our interpretation of channels. Um, there's a functional dependency here. Uh, more importantly, if you look at the fork, you see that the channel that you supply to the the, the process that you're forking off has type S here. We need to compute the dual of S here. And these constraints here are what helps the type system to, to build that up by construction so we don't have to do any, any subsequent proofs. And they're just um, defined via the, this type class. So this is just capturing the, the oh, yeah, sorry. It, it turns out that, yeah, in order to use this, we also need to 
we need to know that the that, that duality, uh, the dual of the dual, um, is the identity. Um, so that's what this type pass captures. And then dual session says that that holds both for the session and its dual. The dual of the dual is the dual is equal to the dual. Um, then we can define. Um, yeah, this, this is how you'd define um, closed linear lambda calculus terms. And then this is how we define closed GV terms parameterized by a channel. But you see here, this is where we get the modularity. We get, you just combine, combine the constraints, and it all works out nicely. And closed corresponds to not changing the linear environment at all. So now, yeah, finally, I'm going to um, tell you what are the interpretations we've implemented are. We have two, um, we gave a monadic interpretation of linear lambda calculus, which we've instantiated in two different ways, using two different monads. First one, CPS, um, which is nice because it's, it's completely type safe. Um, and it, it, it sort of, in some sense, shows that there isn't actually any concurrency in this very limited language on, it, on its own. You can simulate it all by sequential stuff, but it still could be useful for, for encoding protocols in a sequential s system. Uh, there's some interesting technicalities in the translation because it's not non-uniform. Um, we also have a concurrent implementation built on the synchronous channels library, uh, but that, that does require some dynamic casts under the hood. But once you've done that, if that's, if that's correct, then that, that's just your trusted kernel and, and all of your the code on top of that will, will work nicely. Um, other stuff's in the paper. Like I said, this basic calculus isn't actually, it, it doesn't exhibit very interesting concurrency. It has lots of nice properties. It's, it's terminating, it doesn't have data races, it doesn't have deadlocks, but similarly that means you can't actually do all kinds of um, things you might want to do. Access points give a way of um, allowing you to have multiple, a kind of rendezvous mechanism which allows um, all of the, the full expressivity of, uh, that you'd expect. We factor the thing through uh, the CPS transformation through, through polarized GV, which leads to a more uniform CPS translation. Uh, and we compose two embeddings to, together, which um, presents interesting sort of general problems about how to, com to compose these, these finally tagless embeddings in the presence of constraints. And it's not clear how to, to do that while still main maintaining um, the full extensibility of the system. Um, I'm out of time, so I'm going to finish with this slide. If you want to play with the code, you can download it here. I think we can squeeze in one or two questions. So um, you mentioned that in in your embedding of the session types, the the type of the the, the queries is just Haskell types, right? In the slide where you were doing the, the dualization, but in the the example you showed at the beginning, you used this b int. Type. So, so that is, that's a, oh right, yeah, I should have, I didn't give the, that's just a type alias. It's something, it's, um, I think it's, it's bang of int or something. Yeah, yeah but that's what I, I, I mean, like, like why, why, so why not just int? So what, what, what exactly is, is going on? We might have been able to do something slightly simpler, but we, we, we needed some way of explicitly saying that this thing was a bang type to distinguish it from a linear type. As in a, a, a type of something that can be duplicated. So by default, in, in a linear, linear lambda calculus, everything is linear. Is there a reason you didn't use data kinds for defining your session types? Because right now they're all like individual types with no construction. Oh, yes. Why not group them together into a kind? That's something that Lennart mentioned. There's no <laughs> way. We, they're not, I think, or something similar. No, maybe he didn't. He said new type. No. Um, the, 
the only extensible kind is star in Haskell. Right. And we wanted to be modular. But yeah, we did another implementation where you, you and it, yeah, I kind of want open um, promoted data types. But Haskell doesn't have that. OK, I think one more, one more question. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm also a writer of session type library in Haskell. Uh, I'm from, uh, I'm Keigo Imai from GIF University. And I have one question on that. Um, uh, you said that uh, parameter like the model's versions are rather, uh, error, type errors are rather offensive. So if you have any comparison with type errors between parameterized model versions and the URLs, uh, we, I don't know whether Garrett did any experimentation with that. I, I, uh, we looked at the, the previous literature, and the, yeah. it seemed okay, okay. Like the errors in there weren't, weren't very nice. But. And uh, because of the basic, uh, basis of the linear lambda calculus is that uh, the, the, there's many, many river ending of the channel uh, C. In, in the, your code, so uh, I feel it, it is rather cumbersome to write uh, again and again lambda 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 lambda. So it, uh, can 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 we avoid such repetition? Uh, you can, but you, you there are advantages and disadvantages. I mean, I think the, the advantage of this is, I mean, the usual advantage you get by doing things syntactically. It's easier to be more modular. Okay. Uh, ideally, we want. That what would make this much nicer would be implementing something along the lines of Garrett's other talk at ICFP with proper support for linearity built into the language. I mean, none of these embeddings are ever perfect. They're, they're all, all a bit of a hack. But. OK, thank you. Yeah. OK, so let's thank Sam once again. Time to synchronize now with refreshments, and then the next session is 11.45. I believe it's the PC 